Hello, and you're all very welcome back to this afternoon's screening of Searching for Mr. Rugoff. Um, I'm sure you all enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, for me personally, um, I think it definitely uh, scratched an itch. Um, you know, we, we all haven't been able to attend the cinema in quite some time. And um, I think that was a beautiful um, a docu portrait of cinema culture, um, as well as of a, a great man. Um, I'm privileged to be joined by the director, uh, Ira Deutschman. Um, so we're going to talk a little more about it. Ira, hi, how are you doing? Good, good, thanks. Glad you enjoyed the movie. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely did. I, uh, you know, as someone who my, my first professional job was uh, was in a, a film theater and, uh, you know, I was a, a projectionist for many years. I just I've always, you know, the cinema is my my second home, uh, my temple. And uh, and so this this film was really a treat because it is it's as much about um, cinema going, really, um, as it is about the man himself. Um, you were kind of we were talking just before this we started rolling, and you kind of mentioned that um, that didn't necessarily it didn't necessarily start out that way. No, I mean actually, um, when I started working on this movie, um, I didn't really know I was making a movie. I, um, I I started out, you know, as a as a result of being in the film business for a long period of time. I, I end up at a lot of festivals and events where I run into a lot of people who have been in the business for a very long time. And I started to realize that some of the people who were kind of in the generation ahead of me were, um, they were getting old and, you know, the, the stories that they were telling were getting a little less vivid. And, um, and I, I, I just, you know, there, there was this thing that the alarm that went off in my head that, you know, somebody should get this down on tape before these people start disappearing. So I originally thought that this was going to just be an oral history of that period of time. Um, and then as I began to interview people, which I did, you know, very informally and, and, and as, you know, like as I can get people's attention, I just started taping interviews with them. And Rugoff's name just kept coming up over and over again. And I realized, you know, hey, I worked for this guy for three and a half years. Um, not a very long time, actually, but, um, but it was a pretty transformative experience for me. And for years and years and years, I'd been telling outrageous stories about his behavior and about, you know, all the stuff that he did. And, um, and, and suddenly I started to realize that maybe that was the story. And I began this quest to try to find out more about this guy who, you know, had been a very important figure in the film business, but had really disappeared, literally disappeared out of history. People just didn't remember him anymore. So, um, so that was the genesis of the project. And the, the fact that it became this other thing that, that was about that moment in time and the, this, you know, amazing experience that people used to have when cinema was literally in the center of the culture, that happened in the editing room. I mean, I start, suddenly realized I had that material and that, um, and that it was something that I was feeling as I was beginning to, to recreate these stories that had happened to me at that time. So, so a, lot of, a lot of what's in the movie um, uh, you know, evolved over time. It was not, there was no intentionality. I and mean, I didn't start out saying, oh, this is the kind of movie I wanna make. It just sort of happened. That's right, because you mean you did such an incredible job. I, you know, um, I've seen critics describe it as um, you know nostalgic, um, uh, to use one word. But I, I think you know, even as someone who wasn't around back then, um, or even if I had been, I would have been completely the wrong geolocation. Um, it still taps into something so fundamental. I feel that that's become associated with cinema, the specific sort of '70s New York cinema culture that I feel like you feel the absence of it, even if you didn't experience it first. It's kind of like cultural deja vu, you know, that you tapped into. Yeah, I mean, I've been running into that a lot where, um, you know, as you probably know, I, I teach film students at Columbia University in New York. And um, I was showing early rough cuts to my students to get feedback. Um, and I, I was, you know, a little bit trepidatious about it because, you know, it's like they, they were, they're so much younger and don't remember any of this stuff. And I had people coming up to me afterwards, students coming up to me saying, you know, you made me nostalgic for something that I never lived through, which I thought was a, a really great reaction. It was like, you know, yeah, I guess it kind of resonates. Um, you know, one of my hopes, of course, is that now that, you know, we're in this moment where people can't go to theaters at all, 
Um, I, 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 I was sort of hoping this even before that was true, but now more so than ever that maybe this will rekindle people's understanding of why going to the movies is so special. Yeah, I really hope so. And I think, you know, what you're saying about being in this moment, I, I think of that moment in the film, um, you know, as he's talking to, um, um, he's talking about buying Putney Swope and he's saying, you know, I, I don't understand it, but I like it. And I think at the moment, the way so many people are having to adapt their model, whether it's for exhibition or distribution, I think there's a lot of people possibly, you know, wading into untested waters, um, unsure of what they're doing, but having to make the decision that, oh, no, this is the thing that we have to do. Um, and so I think it gives the film, you know, a new relevance um, in that way. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, the, the movies, the movies to me have always been about the other people in the audience. I mean, I, if, if anything, I've discovered about myself that I sometimes enjoy watching the audience more than I like watching a movie. <laughs> um, it's really, you know, there's so many dichotomies in the film, or at least within the man himself, you know, the sort of the professional accomplishments, um, in comparison to the kind of personal feelings that a lot of people talk about in the film and the, you know, these these grand um, theatres that he built that people still have fond memories for. And then his own sort of, we often see him with kind of a disheveled appearance in, in the archive footage. It's great use of archive footage as well, by the way. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, as this as the story was coming together, at what point, because you set out, I, I guess, to make a, a film that was sort of honouring this man. Um, and how did you wrestle with the the honest portrayal of, um, you know, well, we're going to we're going to pay homage to this man, but we're not we're not going to hold back um, about his shortcomings either. Well, I mean, actually, what's so funny about that is that it was actually the reverse. I I thought the movie was going to be much more negative. Um, you know, my my experience. I don't know if this comes across in the movie or not, but my experience working there was that he was an impossible person to work for. I mean, he was really like a terrible boss and and um and and it was i mean i think that the camaraderie um of the people who worked there was based around the fact that there was no hierarchy like you would normally have in a business it was rugoff and then there was everybody else i mean it was like that was that was it um and when i when i set out on this journey to make the movie about him i was expecting way more negative stuff and I was kind of surprised at how much positive people had to say about him. And I think it has something to do with the fact that when I was working there specifically, he was definitely in his downfall period. It was, you know, it was definitely, um, uh, you know, his behavior was perhaps worse than it had ever been. His health was definitely um, not good, even though I didn't understand what was going on with him. Um, and uh, he was making terrible business decisions. So. So I, you know, I walked into this thinking it was going to be about this kind of quirky madman, and um, and and his historical significance kept coming up and up and up as I was interviewing people, and the movie turned out to be way more positive about him than I expected it to be. Wow, and just thinking as well about you know talking about he's downturn I guess um, for want of a better word um, because I, I know like the movie and you, the contributors do um, they're honest about the man's shortcomings um, but I part of me wondered how much um, it wasn't also kind of fated in the sense of you know here's a man who heralded the sort of counterculture of cinema in the 60s and 70s and you know these things come in waves inevitably there's a there's a pushback the commercialization takes over again um, like, do you, would you attribute, uh, you know, that as much as his own shortcomings as a person to being, you know, where he ended up? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, his genius, as well as his downfall, came from the fact that he looked at the world askew. He was just somebody who um, saw the world differently. He didn't have, maybe it was lack of filters that... You know, when you when you're in the movie business for a long time, um, you know, when you and you acknowledge the fact that part of your goal, if you're a distributor or you're a producer or whatever, is to make money for the people who um, invested in your company. You know, you start making decisions that are based on the wrong decisions that you made earlier in your career, and you develop this scar tissue where 
it's like, you know, I'm not doing that sort of thing again. I'm not, I'm not going there because I saw how badly that failed a long time ago. And I think that the biggest lesson I walked away with from working for Rugoff is that, you know, that, that sort of conservatism, if you will, um, about, you know, filtering your feelings about something because you want to make sure that something's going to be successful. You're not going to fall into a trap and lose a lot of money on something that sometimes that works against you that, you know, you don't see the potential in something because of some superficial resemblance to something that didn't work or that, you know, or where you just can't, you know, it, it goes back to what you said earlier about his reaction to Putney Swope. I don't get it, but I like it. It's like, you know, who reacts that way? And, you know, so I think that a lot of the movies that he, that he distributed that really worked were movies that nobody else would have touched because logic would have dictated that those movies wouldn't work. But then by the same token, his, um, his success bred a lot of other people to look for those exceptions, to look for those wacky movies because all of a sudden it was in vogue. And the minute that other people were in that marketplace, he was kind of sunk because he couldn't compete with like the major studios who were starting to make movies for that, uh, that audience. I mean, you know, as I said in the film at one point, um, I don't think that he lost his touch. I think that the world around him changed. The, the, the environment was just very different. And so that sort of thinking that, you know, made his success was no longer working. Right. And that actually kind of feeds into and sort of partially answers a, a follow up question I wanted to ask you personally, um, you know, about these things kind of being cyclical and the world changing around us. Um, but you've had uh, quite a long career um, and have weathered, I imagine, many storms in the business uh, throughout you know, working in exhibition and marketing. Um, I mean, I suppose I don't know if I'm asking for advice exactly or any insight you, you have into having a um, longevity in your career in this business. Yeah, I mean, you know, number one, I think you just have to understand that it's cyclical and that, you know, any anything that you hook into that seems to work is inevitably going to reach a point where it won't work anymore. And that I think the biggest mistake that some people make is to try to look at um, what other people are doing and doing well um, and thinking that you can manufacture that somehow. Um, when in, when in fact, you know, so much of it is serendipity. So much of it is, is, you know, feeding into a cultural moment that is really unpredictable. And, um, and I think that you just have to accept the fact that if you stick to your sweet spot, if you stick to what it is that you understand and you love, um, then the likelihood is the culture will come back around. You know, it's, it is cyclical. Um, whereas if you try to stretch and do things that you don't totally understand because it's for some other audience or whatever, I think that's what, when people get into trouble. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you. And um, when you, when you look at sort of the, the sort of uh, hot companies of, you know, right now and the people like the A24s and the neons of this world and like, do you see them as sort of being, uh, you know, the indirect descendants of what Rugoff did and, you know, this is what's happening now? Uh, yes, I, I believe that, um, that uh, you know, that, that uh, I mean, Rugoff wasn't the only person who was doing all this stuff, but what his major contribution was, was thinking that these kinds of films could be broader and more commercial than anybody gave them credit for, and getting incredibly aggressive about marketing these movies that were really fringy, you know, and I think that the, um, you know, again, these things are cyclical, but I do think that the fact that so many people worked for Rugoff who then went off and worked for other companies that had a fair amount of success in the independent film movement that was more in the you know 80s and 90s um, and then another fallow period and I feel like it's bubbling up again and a lot of the people who are running these companies are people who worked for the companies in the 80s and 90s <laughs> of course you know so so I do think that there that there is a real direct um, you know, connection between, you know, certain methodologies that are, get passed on from generation to generation in, in the business. So much of it, I mean, people keep talking about um, how it's a very seat of the pants kind of business that it's, um, 
you know, that, that, that it's not numbers driven. It's not in the sense of, you know, like where there, uh, you know, market research has limitations in terms of something like the movie business, in terms of what you could really learn and get garner from that information. And, and that so much of it is instinct. And I feel like the, um, that that sensibility is something that you have to be exposed to in order to understand it. And that's why I do think that there is this direct line from Rugoff um, to, you know, to all the, all the companies that has, have followed over the years. And um, also just sticking on sort of modern day comparisons, um, I wonder what you think about um, the current exhibition culture in New York. Um, and is there, do you see, uh, you know, the kind of the culture as typified by the likes of, you know, cinema one and two, like, do you see any modern day antecedents or is that is just completely gone? I think, I think that there's, um, when you look at uh, models like the Alamo Draft House theaters or the Arclight theaters, where there, or even some of the bigger chains where they're heading in a kind of luxury direction, I think some of that is misguided, but I think that it's, it, it is sort of hearkening back to that feeling about the movies being someplace special to go to. And I think that the, in, the, in the intervening years, um, you know, the, the things that have conspired to kind of ruin the sort of thing that Rugoff was instrumental in setting up, you know, one of them is real estate values. You know, in major cities, to have a single screen theater with its own building is just, you know, from the investment perspective, just not the best way to make money on that piece of real estate. So what it did was it forced um, the, the movie theaters in major cities to either move upstairs or move downstairs or, you know, or become larger complexes. I mean, all those sorts of things, I, I, I feel got in the way of making the experience quite as special. It start, sort of starts to feel like a factory in a way. The other thing is, um, is more subtle than that, which is that uh, when Rugoff was booking those theaters, this is alluded to a little bit in the film, but you know, it, it probably bears some additional discussion. Um, every single one of those theaters had to use a, a really unique identity where people expected certain types of films to play in those theaters. And there was kind of a match between the, um, uh, the, the architectural feeling of the building and the kinds of movies that would play there. It was really a, an experience and those, distinctions began to disappear even within his theaters once he was kicked out of the company the people who took over who by the way were good people they're not not saying that they you know ruined things because they're idiots or something it's more just that that the um the way the business was heading they began to look at the entire chain of theaters particularly the concentration on the east side of manhattan as if it was one big multiplex and the theaters were interchangeable and as a result, the, the unique identity of those theaters began to disappear. And I think that that happened everywhere. I mean, you know, where, where there were, you know, there's very few examples anymore of theaters where you really understand their sensibility. Now, Alamo Draft House is an example. Um, it's, they don't, they're not ex actually an art film theater. I um, mean, I don't know in Ireland how much people are aware of their, their business model, but it's, it's really more of a restaurant than it is a theater. Um, mm. they, they figured out a way of um, serving food and drinks um, in a very unobtrusive way where it doesn't get in the way of you, of the experience of watching the movie, which to me is, you know, that's paramount. Otherwise, <laughs> you know, why, why, why would you go to a place like that? Um, but they, um, the management of that company and they, they get all of the theater managers involved as well they have a very interesting kind of culty um, sensibility where um, they, they focus in on things that we would normally call like midnight movies or, you know, sort of hokey genre films. And that they, they're very good at programming things in a way that does harken back to that idea of the theater having a sensibility that it's associated with. And of course, serving alcohol helps <laughs> with that particular strain of films. Definitely. Yeah, well, there, we don't have the Alamo Draft House over here, but definitely um, the eventizing of cinemas, uh, the, you know, the addition of luxury to the space um, 
is definitely becoming a, a thing uh, here. So we're, yeah, we're seeing that as well. Um, uh, I kind of have to ask you uh, if you've seen um, Abel Ferrara's recent documentary, The Projectionist, uh, because it's almost in conversation with yours in a way. Yeah, no, I haven't. I want to. Um, I've heard about it, and I've heard that comment from other people as well. <laughs> of course. Um, so, uh, but I haven't been able to get my hands on it yet, so I, I, I will definitely check it out at some point. It's interesting. I never thought I would be watching uh, two documentaries in the one year that mention uh, Putney Swope and, and talk about you know such specific um, cultural reference points um, in that era. Um, I'll wrap it up a bit. I just want to, I wanted to ask you, you know, um, Don's son alludes in the movie uh, to his love of documentaries. Um, um, I wonder what you think he would think of the film that you've made. It's a good question. Um, you know, uh, Sarah Kernikin, um, who is in the movie, she's the one who directed the film Marjo. Marjo. Um, Sarah writes on the internet a lot uh, about her belief in ghosts and, um, and she has a house in Martha's Vineyard and she went, recently wrote me and told me she went and visited Rugoff's grave and told him all about the movie and that he approved. Um, so um, hopefully that's real. I, don't, <laughs> I have no idea. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't know how he would feel about it. Um, you know, I'm, I can tell you his sons are very happy with the movie and that makes me very happy. I was very, I was very nervous before I showed the film to them because I was worried that they would think I, you know, was too negative or too positive. I, I you know, I had no idea, um, uh, but they're very happy with it. And I think that they're particularly happy that, that the movie has brought back his legacy to some extent. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, based on the fact that there's so little photographic um, material about him, you know, still photographs, very, very few. Most of what I found was either in publications that happened at that time or I got some stuff from his family. But um, but almost no uh, actual, you know, film footage of him. And it indicates to me that he didn't like seeing himself um you know in in imagery um and it, it kind of makes sense because i mean he you know is as especially as he got um further along in his illness he was not um he probably didn't like the way he looked um but uh you know so so that gives me maybe a little bit of a clue about the fact that he maybe would be uncomfortable you know, by the way, I, I'm uncomfortable seeing myself up on the screen. So, you know, that was a decision that I made that I was very reticent to do. Um, I, you know, I, I, I felt like I had no choice ultimately, but um, I tried to do everything I could to avoid it initially. Um, well, um, it worked out wonderfully. And, um, you know, yeah, I think, I think your documentary uh, definitely paints a picture of a man who he wanted his legacy to be in the in the work that he left behind and the and the buildings and the experiences that he left behind which which i definitely um you know now thanks to your film um i think will be a, a lasting legacy um i also just love the ending as well the idea even though you know it could have been under better circumstances it's a pity that he was broke but the idea of spending your last days um you know turning an old church into a, a cinema um in massachusetts that just sounds like uh that sounds like a retirement plan to me, <laughs> if it was possible. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's just wonderful that he was, um, you know, that, that he was so committed to it, that he, that that was like his last thing that he did. Yeah, I love that idea. Um, and, and I love the film. Thanks again for, um, for letting us uh, share it with our audiences uh, here at the festival. Um, thanks for talking to me today. And um, best of luck with the, the film going forward. Um, thanks very much, Ari. Okay, thanks. My pleasure.